Good evening. Welcome to the launch of VTAPE's fall season of programming. My name is Lisa Steele. I'm the artistic director of VTAPE, where we acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit River, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. Toronto is in the Dish with One Spoon territory, which is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and the Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Sub subsequent Indigenous nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, Europeans and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Tonight, we open the curatorial incubator V17. On the other side, it's heaven. We're not quite there yet, but we're anticipating that heaven. Throughout the fall, we'll be hosting four different programs that respond to this theme. All programs will be available online only on the VTAPE website, www.vtape.org. And But this year, we're gonna do things a little bit differently as you'll see from tonight's presentation. Each program will begin with an introduction uh, by the emerging curator or a collective, followed by the, all the titles in their program, uh, their full program, and then followed by a live conversation between the curator and their artists. And each program will be available for viewing on the VTAPE website for three weeks after the launch. Also, please look on the VTAPE website under the publications tab, which is on the left side, uh, uh, for the full catalog for this year's Curatorial Incubator V17 on the other side, it's heaven. It's a beautiful catalog, so please do look at it. We have a few um, actual hard copies available this year, so we're back, at, we're back at it. We're full steam ahead with uh, full publication and full, uh, full screenings, so we're very happy. All the curatorial essays, program notes, and bios for the artists and the curators are here. Now, to Excuse me, tonight we present the program curated by Crocus Collective, comprised of uh, Karina Ishkandarsha and Dallas Fellini. The program, Gender Trash from Hell to Heaven, is a mini retrospective of the groundbreaking work of transsexual activist and sex worker, Marie Soleil Ross. Before I introduce you to Crocus Collective, I should say that Vivian Namaste was not available tonight, but we are so pleased to have Monica Forrester, also a co-director of Madame Lorraine's Transsexual Touch, a wonderful work we're gonna view in just a few minutes. Uh, she is with us tonight. So she's gonna join at Crocus Collective in conversation at the conclusion of the screening. Crocus Collective, previously Riverdale Projects, is a Toronto-based collective led by Karina Ishkender. <laughs> I asked for this to be spelled out, and of course I can't do it now. <laughs> okay, Karina, sorry, try again. Ishkander Shah and Dallas Fellini. Born in 2020 out of an artistic partnership with Riverdale Hub. Their mission is to focus on community building, exploring the function of art and social practice, and supporting emerging, emerging artists. Take it away. Thank you, Lisa and VTAPE. Uh, we're so excited to be sharing our program tonight. And so thank you for joining us online. So this summer we had the privilege of researching in the VTAPE archives and collections, which was an awesome experience. Um, and so in our initial research proposal, we sought to explore queer desire and futurity as they relate to video art um, and activism in different time periods. And our research kept bringing us back to the work of Mira Sully Ross. And we quickly realized that she and her community and her collaborators, one of whom we'll be talking to at the end of the screening, um, had already laid out this amazing groundwork for an integrated approach towards um, art and activism. Yeah, so we wanted to um, introduce our screening by giving a little bit of background on Mira Soleil Ross. Uh, she is a transsexual videographer, performance artist, sex worker, and activist. She's from Quebec, and a lot of the work that she's really well known for um, was made actually while she was living in Toronto, including a number of her video works, as well as her zine, Gender Trash from Hell, which was published from 1993 to 95. and is actually from where our program takes its title. Uh, Ross has a indisputable spot 
as a recognized pioneer of queer video art. And we've found that a lot of our peers who are our age, uh, for context, were both very young, uh, weren't necessarily super familiar with Ross's work. And I think that that just speaks to um, the very unfortunate sort of like queer generational amnesia that sometimes occurs in communities. But despite this, I'm confident that every trans person I know and every sex worker I know has felt the very real effects of uh, Ross's social and community work and activism, including uh, her gender trash from Halzine, uh, which sort of was a platform for trans people to find community in a time where the internet wasn't accessible to everyone, but as well as initiatives like her meal trans program at the 519 created uh, with Monica Forrester, our guest speaker for today, uh, which that program is actually still providing free meals and legal support to trans people today, as well as initiatives like Counting Past Two, which was Ross's transsexual and transgender film festival, which laid a lot of the groundwork uh, in making spaces for self-representation for trans people, which as we know is still very much a battle being fought today. So Mira Soleil Ross has this really manifold legacy that we saw as connecting well with the curatorial incubators theme of heaven. And we were really excited to explore and celebrate that legacy and frame it um, as Ross contributing to a potential heaven for generations of trans people and sex workers through her videos and performance art and activism. And it feels significant to return to her work at this time and to, to look at the works that she was creating in the 1990s and early 2000s, which were really ahead of their time and uh, to place them into today's context. So in the screening, we've included uh, three Mira Soleil Ross films, all made between 2001 and 2002. And to some extent, all three films are part of this dedicated work towards political, social, and sexual liberation for trans women and sex workers. Um, and in these films, we see this being actualized through self-representation, community care, and creating space for desire. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to share and remember and celebrate this important work today. Uh, so our screening includes three of Ross's video and performance works, uh, beginning with Tremblement de Cher from 2001, uh, and then Madame Lorraine's Transsexual Touch, also from 2001, and then finishing with Allo Performance from 2002. In Tremblement de Cher, Ross mediates her own representation situating sexuality and beauty within her experience as a transsexual woman. And then in the next work, uh, Madame Lorraine's Transsexual Touch, which is a longer work, Ross collaborates with Monica Forrester and Vivian Namaste to create a community-oriented film that really cleverly interweaves sex work and activism uh, and education with um, steamy sex scenes and the personal narratives of four transsexual sex worker characters. Uh, finally, in Allo performance, footage, footage of Ross wearing a prosthetic pregnancy belly is accompanied by an audio recording of her mother recounting her experiences of having a baby and raising Ross as a child in a performance that explores transsexual women's relationships uh, to the personal and institutional aspects of motherhood. Uh, and please stick around after we screen these works. We're going to be having a conversation. Uh, we're really excited to have the opportunity to speak with sex work activist, Monica Forrester. Um, and yeah, before we begin the screening, I did just want to offer up a content warning, um, which you may have inferred from my description of the works. Some of the works include nudity and pornography. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything. Why don't we start with the screening? Welcome back everybody. I'll just wait a few minutes. Everybody to tune in. A wonderful screening. Fantastic work. Thank you, Dallas. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Monica, for your, uh, your work. It's fantastic. Uh, I want just a reminder uh, that the full catalog for this year's Curatorial Incubator V17 on the other side, it's heaven, is available on the VTAPE website 
And it's uh, under, there's a section called what's on on the left side and under that is publications. So um, the curatorial essays, program notes, and bios for the artists and curators are there. So um, let's go to the conversation. Um, I think Karina, you are going to um, start. Yeah, I just wanted to introduce everyone to Monica. Uh, so Monica Forrester runs a grassroots organization called Transpired Toronto that I encourage you all to uh, look up and donate to if you can after this event. Um, Monica is also a program and outreach coordinator at Maggie's Toronto. Um, since 1999, Monica has worked in various agencies to educate and make services accessible for trans folks from living and working on the streets to being instrumental in creating a drop-in and outreach program for trans people at the 519. She was also part of advocating for trans women to be allowed into women's shelters and in creating policies to prevent shelters from discriminating against trans women. Um, so yeah, we asked Monica to join us today because um, She's very instrumental in the community and it does amazing community care work. Um, and she also worked alongside Mira Sole Ross um, in activism and also in art and video. Um, and um, as you've probably noticed, Monica is one of the collaborators on one of the films that we just screened, Madame Lorraine's Transsexual Touch. So yeah, hi Monica, thank you for joining us today. Welcome. Thanks for having me today. And it was so great to watch that video that's like over 20 years old. And I kind of like, wow, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, thank Are you, you seeing it any differently today than when from when um, you made it? Yeah, well, you know, I think it was very daring at the time to do something like that, you know, but I think it was it was so innovative and so like to think that, you know, community wanted something that was their own, that they directed and produced, you know what I mean, to the viewers that were going to watch this video it was really important to bring an awareness. Uh, and like you said, some community kind of uh, so activism through that, right? So, yeah, so and it's kind of from that led me to so many different videos I produce presently, like, um, Remembering the Living, down, the um, gentrification of the downtown east side, uh, two-spirited uh, 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 video that we did for service users. So it's really actually empowered me to get out there and bring more voices to the screen and bring more awareness to people in our community. That's so awesome to hear. Yeah, that's so great to hear. Um, we mentioned before that you uh, co-directed uh, Madame Lorraine's transsexual touch. I guess people watching today maybe noticed that you also co-starred uh, yes. in the film. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, your experience both being a director and an actor in the film and and working alongside Mira Soleil Ross. Yeah, so it was something like very new, like I've never directed before. So Vivian and um, Mir Slay kind of approached me and asked me if I wanted to be a part of this project. And this project, it was like the process was so amazing. I learned so much through it, but it also was a process. It wasn't something that was just did overnight. We had to really do a script. We had to consult with different communities and different cities. So it allowed us to travel to like Vancouver, Montreal and other areas of uh, Canada to get more of a voice to what people wanted. So it wasn't just about what we wanted, but it was about what does community want to portray in this video. What do we want people to know about trans people and our bodies and the sex and the work that we do, right? So um, the process was good. It really taught me a lot around how to engage with community, understand community better, you know what I mean? I think, you know, our experiences are so different when it comes to, you know, create culture, working indoors, outdoors, uh, you know what I mean? Um, so it really allowed me to get uh, like intimate with different community members and listen to their work and their experiences. And, you know, um, people would always like, something I've always talked about, I found appreciation of my body when society didn't appreciate my body because it was different, you know what I mean? Or said they could have, someone couldn't love a body like a trans woman's body or a trans man's body because our bodies are not 
you know, this ideology of male or female, you know what I mean? So sex work allowed me to really love my body and that people loved my body, you know? And so when people say, you found, uh, you know, appreciation and, and people that loved your body through sex work, yes. You know, we got to remember our, our society is very, still today, you know, there's still a lot of stigma about people that love trans people. You know what I mean? And sometimes men or women or non-binary people find trans people through areas like sex work so they can still be able to to love someone's body and be with a trans woman, but also, you know, be discreet about it. And, you know, we're doing a lot of work today to bring more visibility and awareness to, to say that trans people deserve the same amount of love and it's not... You know, it's not bad to love a trans woman, you know, so there's still a lot of stuff going on, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So this process really, you know, like I said, I went in there with knowing nothing, you know what I mean? Mira Soleil and I uh, had a lot more knowledge and, you know, she really is someone that inspired me, you know what I mean, to do the work that I'm doing presently. But I really looked up to her with all the activism and, you know, just being out there as an individual, you know, breaking boundaries and, you know what I mean, to bring awareness and visibility when at a time, you know, there was so much stigma and discrimination for trans folks, you know what I mean? So um, I really give my kudos to her, you know what I mean? And all the work that she's kind of laid out for a lot of us, you know what I mean? And not to be, you know what I mean, unapologetic about who you are and what you want to present, you know what I mean? And that we're all individuals and, you know, we should be able to portray those pieces of who we are within society or whatever platform that you're going to, you know, showcase that. I'm just, um, I love that I'm, I'm picking up on what you said about how sex word has sex work uh, empowered you and made you feel empowered in many ways and I'm wondering how you think um, activism for sex workers and especially trans, trans sex workers has changed in the past couple of years or in the past couple of decades rather since we mm-hmm. left. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's changed a lot. I think, you know, through the mobilization of, of sex workers, you know, and being very visible and have a variety of platforms has really encouraged and empowered people to be more visible of what they believe that sex work is work. It's sexual liberation, it's work, it's, you know what I mean? And for, and uh, to dismiss these ideas that we're victims or, you know what I mean, that, you know, uh, you know, that we can't make choices, you know what I mean? So um, the social movement has really come to a place where, you know, that has really brought on a lot, has changed a lot of maybe feminist views around, you know what I mean, around this work have, you know, for many decades, they looked at it as disempowering for women or abuse against women, you know what I mean? And really taking away the voices of people in the sex industry, you know what I mean? And something I learned when I took this feminist course, they always said, our bodies are choices, you know what I mean? So within sex work, that's our body and our choice. And why does that not extend to people in this in these communities right so um i think you know as we bring more visibility and platforms around the importance of the work and what this work has really done to empower people you know what i mean in their lives really allows a bigger discussion among people around yeah well maybe i really need to really think about sex work and why do i have these ideas you know what i mean we need to take the moral part about sex work out of these equations and really look out you know this is labor i'll tell you i did sex work i still do I have a few regulars, but, you know, it's work. Believe me, it is a lot of work. You know what I mean? It's a lot of time. You have to have good, uh, you know, customer service skills. You got to know how to manage your money. You have to know how to advertise. Plus, you got to do the work. And believe me, with the complexity of different clients coming to you, believe me, it's a lot of work. Right? So, you know, but and but like I, I was telling you earlier, I found myself through sex work. I found myself 
to love my body. And I think a lot of sex workers have, have, you know, having discussions with people in the sex industry has empowered them in so many ways, which society has disempowered them. You know what I mean? So I think when you're a marginalized or racialized group or trans people, for example, that are always dealing with these kind of these ideas and narratives, you know what I mean? It really allows us to really like reflect, allowed me to reflect that like, you know, like I said, someone loves my body for who it is, for what it is. You know what I mean? Um, you know, so um and and the work, you know what I mean? The work is a multi-billion dollar industry. You know what I mean? And when we think about sex work, it's not something, you know, so we, you know, to to have platforms to kind of to to rise up around what is important in this community and the vibrancy in this community, that you know, we're not just sex workers. As you can tell, we produce videos. We run so many different things in our society, society, right? So to also share those things really dismisses all these ideas of what society really wants us to see sex work out. I love that um, you keep coming back to this idea of um, self love and like empowerment in that way, and I feel like it also sort of connects to what you were saying. Uh, about, you know, like public education, about like people seeing sex workers as people. Um, and I'm trying, I might actually be misremembering this, but I'm thinking of the letter that uh, you, along with a, a bunch of other sex worker activists, Mira Soleil Ross, Vivian Namaste, uh, yeah. Jamie Lee Hamilton penned to uh, the social service agencies for transsexual uh, organizations. And I think maybe I'm misattributing this thing that I read, but I think it was in this letter where uh, you were talking about how um, sex workers actually do a lot of work for um, for uh, like public opinion on trans people and a lot of like the men who are like uh, having sex with transsexual sex workers, maybe that's the first transsexual person they met. Um, and in mm. a way it is a public service to all to all trans people, not just sex working trans people. Oh, it definitely is, right? So we, well, we're at the forefront, you know what I mean? We're the ones, the first contact. You got to remember before social media, trans sex workers were working the streets. That's where I met my friends. And that's where I started my work. There was no advertising then. You know what I mean? So a lot of our activism, and we think of activism, activism was going on in those communities. You know what I mean? Uh, and so was harm reduction. When we think this new boom of the last 20 years of harm reduction, you know, sex workers were doing harm reduction way before harm reduction even had to work. You know what I mean? We were we were educating and trying to keep people safe, even though we had limited tools to keep people safe. And yes, we had an increase of HIV and hepatitis C, but we were still doing that work at the forefront. You were still educating people on how to stay safe with limited resources, right? So um, yeah, so sex workers have really been at the forefront of a lot of different things. When we think of the Me Too, Me Too movement, I was like there, you know, showcasing that. I'm you can catch the video on YouTube. But you know, all these different movements around around women or trans people dealing with sexual assault, or you know, we've always been at the forefront because our experiences are into are, are multi-layered in a lot of these issues that a lot of women's issues are going on. You know, like the slut shaming. You know what I mean? So this is something that, you know. Uh, you know, we were part of to bring awareness that this is what sex workers deal with ongoing, you know what I mean? But also that it's not okay to slut shame people regardless of the way they look, what they do, or how they dress, right? So we've always been in the forefront of making sure, we, uh, you know, that we're part of those movements to bring awareness. I'm not saying we always get the best outcomes of those situations or the grunt of some of those those situations but we've always been a part of making sure that we were part of making change that was so important and many different women's groups not just the uh, trans or the sex working groups right so this letter was also to inform you know what i mean service providers you know what i mean because we got to remember 
you know, things are changing. I think, you know, as voices have gotten louder, things have, have obviously evolved in a better way instead of using this kind of saving tactic, you know what I mean, uh, around sex workers or trans people that need to be saved. No, you need to listen to us. You know, you need to listen to us on what we need. We need to be the voices of what these services look like and how they're going to best support us in our lives, not what you think is important for us. You know, so I think, you know, um, it's still happening that way. You know, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. I think well, when I tell you about Trans Pride Toronto, I was silenced in one of my jobs. Actually, when I was working with Mir Soleil, I was silenced about, you know, about you know, bettering the lives of sex trans workers, you know what I mean? Instead of just giving them a healthy meal and a place to stay once a week for a couple hours, that we needed more, you know? And I was silent to say that, you know, you don't have a voice in what happens here, you know what I mean? And that really bothered me because, you know, these were non-trans people dictating what we needed and not what community needed, you know? So that's when I said, screw you, you're not going to silence me. I'm going to move on and create Trans Pride Toronto where we can have a voice of what we need and what we need as a community to thrive, to be visible, to be, you know, um, to be included in many different services that, that everyone take for granted in our society. We just want basic human rights. You know what I mean? And, you know, and it's even harder for trans people to fight for that. So, you know, um, so this pinning of this uh, letter was just to tell them, like, hey, you know what I mean? You're forfeited. You're, you know, they, they're capitalizing on our lives. Then you need to have better outcomes for our lives, not capitalize on money uh, for trans people. And all this kind of stemmed from the 1997 uh, triple murder of Deanne Wilkinson and Tegan and the cisgender woman Brenda, when they finally realized that trans people needed a space where they can feel safe, where they can, you know, come together and talk about what's going on in their lives and empower each other to, you know, stay safe and stuff like that. So. I remember talking with you in our previous conversation about the differences between grassroots organizations and sort of like agencies and institutions and how um, you've had to be very critical of people's intentions in larger agencies. Um, maybe you could speak more about this, like the difference between um, looking out for community um, like in those in different spaces. Okay, uh, can you repeat that? Because you kind of were cutting out there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, we, we talked previously about sort of the difference between um, working in grassroots organizations and working in agencies. And yeah. you could speak to a little bit about the differences there for you. Okay. Well, I'll see, well, just grassroots agencies are grad students through communities that are part of that process that have, you know, created that space right so they they have a mission and you know they they engage with each other on what they want what is they strategically plan what they want to see for their communities in the future you know what i mean what are the short-term and the long-term goals you know what i mean so looking at the issues on the ground homelessness unemployment uh criminalization sex work the laws you know what i mean so these are some of the some of the short-term stuff and then looking at long-term stuff of how we can build more funding uh, around to make sure that we can uh you know um create, uh, you know, jobs for trans people to build skills to be employed or to build funds where we can help people get housing or, you know what I mean, uh, with agencies <coughs> have a different, <coughs> sorry, I, I got the allergies, I should be muting. But with the agencies that I've worked with, you know, we're just, uh, they just, we're not part of the bigger program. We're there, we're either accessing the programs, uh, we're not like a specific group that they're targeting. You know, so yes, they will jump on something from the city that says, uh, you know, um, harm reduction and prevention for trans folks. You know what I mean? Say so they, they will apply for that funding. It uh, doesn't mean that they're working with trans folks to, to make sure those programs are, first of all, successful, that they're not creating harm, uh, you know, that they're, they're, they're employing trans folks. 
Uh, you know what I mean? So that's something I recognize that, you know, uh, there's so many roadblocks when it comes to agencies applying for trans funding and not really consulting with community, not really having policies that actually reflect those communities that you're actually applying for funding to. When I talk to trans folks that are going to these agencies, they're feeling stigmatized. They're feeling they're being barred because of just a basic having an argument with someone. You know what I mean? Some of these policies really infringe on the human rights of trans folks. You know what I mean? So, you know, grassroots agencies are a collective of people that actually, you know, get community together, ask them what they need. They are part of the process of making these programs happen. You know what I mean? Getting their voices. You know, through my programs, it's not about what I think community needs. It's about communities involvement of what they need and allowing them to have the direction of where that program is going and what they need, like I said, in the short term or the long term. You know, I'm not saying there's not a lot of agencies doing a lot of great work. You know what I mean? But we have to really recognize, you know what I mean, that, you know, um, we need to really start investing in more grassroots agencies that are really, you know, underfunded, you know what I mean, that are really doing more like the work than a lot of these other agencies, right? So um, I'm not trying to knock agencies, you know what I mean? It's always great that we can have spaces, but I think agencies also need to step up and making sure there's policies that reflect trans people, that are not going to stigmatize them, discriminate against them, that they have a mandate of hiring trans people within those agencies to bring a reflection to the communities they're serving and allowing equitable excuse me, did I say fuck? Allowing equitable, sorry, equitable, you know what I mean? Pay, you know what I mean? Full-time work, you know what I mean? I think some of this, this funding really doesn't really allow trans people to come out of poverty. You know what I mean? They, they, they fit a quota where they're hiring trans people, but they're not living equitably like everyone else, right? So we have to really look at how agencies are really being inclusive and working equitably with community to, uh, to, to better their outcomes in their lives and stuff, right? So. Yeah, and it's it's so good that, I mean, there are agencies like what you're doing with Trans Pride Toronto that are really invested in, in community yeah. in that way. Oh, uh, definitely. And, you know, we've really worked really hard to bring visibility. Over COVID, we've been doing our meet and greet outreach every weekend. I really want to give a hands out to the many people that have donated to Trans Pride Toronto to make this you know, we have healthy meals, hot meals in the winter, even in the summer. We're giving out much needed clothing and supplies and we can do it with the community that's been so supportive. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Street Health that's really taken the initiative to really help Transpire Toronto get get that funding and do some partnering aid uh, drop-ins. So we have weekly uh, women's and trans women's drop-ins going on, you know, and we just got some international funding, which we're going to be able to hire some BIPOC people to get some skills and get them out there and uh, engage with the community. So things are slowly happening, but like I said, it's slowly, but you know, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm really in a happy place right now. So, you know, I think we were satellite for so many years and that was due to like just the hardship of getting funding, you know, so we actually have a space. We've had it for two years and of course COVID hit. So we couldn't do any indoor stuff. So we've been doing outdoors and it's been working well. You know what I mean? Community has been really staying connected, you know, and COVID's really, sharp, you know, for a lot of our trans folks has been really hard, you know what I mean, when we think around food, when we think around housing, uh, tent city, and you know what I mean, all these different things that uh, trans folks have been experiencing. So, you know, we're really trying to work with partnering people and trying to make sure that people are not forgotten through this pandemic. So. That's so great to hear. Monica, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit um, about sort sort of how you got your start in activism. Wow, well, um, how did I get my start in activism? Wow, um, I don't know. You know what? That's something that just happens. I think you know. I think having that, you know, like I said, activism is something that um, 
I didn't know there was a word for it. Like when I was a teen, I think coming into the community and 80% of the people that I knew that were trans folks were homeless. We lived in underground garages or buildings or abandoned houses, you know, and some of the stigma we would face around uh, accessing like shelters or, or even drop-in spaces, people are just like, who are these people? And, you know, what are we going to do with them? Like this was in the 80s and early 90s where agencies didn't even have the capacity to really work with trans folks to non-binary folks. And, you know, so I think it was just seeing, you know, when I'm witnessing my friends at 2021 dying so prematurely from like overdoses or suicide or even HIV and AIDS because of lack of healthcare or stigma accessing healthcare. You know what I mean? That's really bothered me to really step up and say, you know, we need to do, you know, I need to get out there and bring more awareness and and fight for the, the, the lives of friends. But it took, you know, 10 or 20 of my friends to die within a 10 year span to recognize that I needed to bring my voice to these concerning issues. You know, um, so I think, you know, starting with Mir Slay at the drop and outreach allowed me to have a voice. You know, this was my way of getting in there, engaging with services, uh, bringing more of awareness and visibility to what we needed when it came to like, you know, HIV services or ho- housing services or shelters, you know, uh, I did a shelter uh, evaluation to over 100 shelters in the city for the city to around accessibility. You know, trans folk, trans women were going to men's shelters, you know, they were being abused physically and sexually. You know, we needed to change that. You know, um, so I think it was just, you know, unconsciously don't even think about it. You're just out there. And I think just reflecting of all my friends that have passed because of these things that, a lot of cis people take for, for granted, like, you know, granted, you know what I mean? That, you know, that trans people really have to fight to get, you know? So, um, so like I said, I just, just started getting, going out there and bringing a voice and really opening up about who I was. Like, you know, I had to make a decision about my own personal life and, and how that was going to look on a bigger stage to, you know what I mean? But I needed to be authentic with who I am to make change, you know, so being open about my sex work experience, being open about my drug use, being open about my homelessness, you know what I mean? And even though, you know, it was hard because, you know, I was now this open book to, to the world. And uh, yeah, and I, and it created a lot of stigma for some spaces that I accessed. But at the end of the day it was what I needed to do to bring a human face to what was so important to make change. Uh, you know, and I don't regret it today. You know, I've, it, I've worked in over 20 agencies, you know, and they've, you know, I've learned so much working in those agencies and have changed policy perspectives around trans people, uh, you know, brought more inclusion and visibility, you know, and I'm not saying I got every job that I applied for, but at least leaving that, that job interview, people were sitting back thinking, wow, you know what I mean? And maybe hopefully the next trans person that applies for a position there will get it. So I was kind of like the poster girl, but, you know, but I, it was something that I needed to do. I think it was something that we, I needed to do to bring more visibility and, and take away this narrative, you know what I mean? That we're, you know, we're not educated. We're all just this, we're all just that. That we're, we're you know, we're just like everyone else in society. You know what I mean? That we can do the same sort of work. You know what I mean? That we can be trusted. You know what I mean? And stuff like that. So yeah, that's where it all just kind of started and it's kept going. And then when we think around the Laura Wells that, that, you know, died, you know, tragically a couple of years ago, and we had an agency that's well known in the community that's hosting trans people and the police were all, you know, they knew about this body and did nothing to inform community to can we keep community safe and their excuses are we didn't want to, you know, create this big uh, fear within the community. What do you mean you don't want to trans people are dealing with violence daily in their lives. Murder is on the rise all the time. We look at the state, the trans person dying every day. 
You know what I mean? So to say that we we didn't want to create this fear, you know, you were setting trans people up to more, you know what I mean, uh, violence. So, you know, holding them accountable to, to Alora's death and, you know, uh, you know, was really important to really say, you know, you can apply for funding and host programs for trans folks, but when we're found dead, you don't, you kind of just sweep us under the rug. You know, that's unacceptable. You know, and then we have a police system that's telling that they're working so hard within the LGBTQ2S communities, but you, you know, you're doing nothing when we're reporting a Laura Wells missing. They're telling us all oh, because she's homeless, a sex worker, and a drug user that, you know, here's a number, go call someone else. You know what I mean? That is unacceptable. You know what I mean? So we need to challenge these systemic issues within our society. You know, and I think it's very important. And as a trans woman, that was scary. You know, I have a lot of privilege and, and a, a lot of different platforms. And it's great because it allows me to kind of make change. But when I'm outside of those platforms, I'm very vulnerable. When I'm outside on the streets, I'm very vulnerable. So challenging police, which we know, police have a history and we don't want to go into that but I was very scared of the repercussions but I knew at the same time you know I live past the quota and I want to live another 50 years but I lived past the quota of 30 that I think it was very important that we needed someone in the community to stand up to bring visibility to you know to create change you know I'm, I'm not saying change has happened yet. We're still, you know, it's part of the internal review. Uh, you know, we have recommendations, the new uh, intern chief of police saying he's going to reinforce these recommendations. So we're just waiting to see what that looks like. But once again, you know, um, I've been really mobilizing community. That's something I really love to do within my groups to give them the the power and the empowerment to bring a platform and a voice, right? Because, uh, you know, all our experiences are different. We need to bring those to the forefront. You know what I mean? So that's what I love doing is engaging with community, getting them to be a part of these social movements, social justice movements. You know what I mean? And those can look in many different ways. We don't always have to have someone in the forefront where they might fear because they work the streets or they're homeless, they're easily targeted, but how they can still make change behind the scenes through social media, through so many different other ways. So, you know, engaging in community is really important and having figures within those communities to empower community, to bring voices to what is so important for change. And I can blah, blah, blah. So. <laughs> uh, well, it's wonderful to hear you speak and I want to thank you very much Monica uh, on behalf of VTape. Thank you Dallas Fellini. Thank you Katerina Ishkin. <laughs> that that I want to name thank I could never get but Monica for us Forrester uh, and for all of this wonderful and and of course Marie Soleil Ross for the wonderful work that she has done on behalf of of, of trans uh, people of sex workers. Uh, and of uh, bringing this, and you know, thank you, uh, Dallas and 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 Karina for bringing this work to us at V Tape. It's um, it's wonderful to see it again. We haven't seen it for a little while. Uh, we've known Marie for a long time since she made the original works, um, and it's great to see these works again. Great to meet you, Monica. And I want to also thank uh, Kira Bolt and Dustin Lawrence for their work uh, in, uh, and, and there were a few bumps and anybody who's watched and you saw, perhaps you had to click around to find this, uh, the program. We had a little issue because something changed on our website and we had forgotten that by the time we were getting started today, but uh, everything worked out. So thank you very much. And I want to, um, uh, hope you'll join us again on September 30th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time with Program 2, A World of Our Own, Creating Black Queer Utopias, which is curated by Mahalat Kuff, who is a Winnipeg-based artist and uh, curator. And uh, in the meantime, Gender Trash from Hell to Heaven, the program you've just watched, will be available for the next three weeks on the VTape website. Um, please watch again or pass the link to friends and colleagues who might enjoy it. And please, um, good night. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in and be safe. Good night. Thank you. Have a good Bye. night. Bye.